Welcome to episode 90 of Let's Talk Geek, affectionately entitled Ubuntu 1204 Runs Steam on the ZX Spectrum. But in today's show, we have Derek Hershaw of MWeb's ISP division. He heads it up and he's telling us about the uncapped ADSL price cuts they recently made. We also have the new Ubuntu and running Steam on Linux and Lightbox's beta on Linux, as well as the Google Drive rumors, which have been confirmed to be true by a launch. Thank you for watching. Welcome to episode 90 of Let's Talk Geek. 90 years old. That's, well, episodes old. 90 episodes. That's pretty old. Mm. So thank you for joining us. This one's recorded on the 25th of April, 2012. One week after MWeb launched, uh, or after MWeb cut its uh, uncapped ADSL pricing. And so with us, with us in the show today, we've got Derek Herschel from MWeb. Very cool. Thanks for joining us, Derek. Hi, Derek. Hi, Derek. Cool. Yeah. The, Derek, um, I think uh, the, the place to start is uh, with your role at MWeb. Uh, what do you do at MWeb? Um, I'm the CFO or the CEO, sorry, of, uh, of the ISP business. So in the MWeb group of companies, I look after the, the internet business. Great. And uh, take us through the, the, the price cuts. Um, who benefits and, and how are you able to cut the prices like you have? Okay, uh, from an MWeb perspective, uh, I think everybody benefits. We've, uh, as we've always done in the past, whenever there's been any sort of uh, reduction on the IPC pricing, we've typically reinvested that in the network and just bought more capacity. Uh, the nice, the nice thing this time around is that the uh, the cuts were so significant. I mean, thirty percent is a big number. That's huge. Mm -hmm. um, that we were able to put something back into the network again, as we've done in the past. So you know, all our customers benefit from that. Um, but more significantly, then we. You know, we took the view of uh, of what do we want to do in terms of doing something significant. We could have given a little bit of, you know, price relief to everybody. But as we did when we launched Uncapped, you know, we thought this was a, one of those golden moments to do something, you know, in the fixed line space that would really have a, a meaningful impact. So um, with, with Uncapped really being established now, I think, you know, if I look at our own customer base, you know, well over 60% of our base is, is on Uncapped. Um, we thought that this was a good opportunity to drive, you know, the sort of, flip side to ADSL, which is, is really about speed. Um, so we targeted you know, our entry-level product, so the 384 product, 384 kilobits product, and the 1 meg product, and, um, and effectively combined them into one service now. So that's our new entry-level product. Um, if you were on a 384 kilobit product before, you're getting it you know, 20 rand less, but if you were on the 1 meg product before, you're getting it 100 rand less, so that's a significant saving. Mm. And, and the and, two products um, are priced at, uh, at the same level now, is that correct? Yes, they are. They're both priced at the same level. Okay. Um, so we're, we're reasonably optimistic that uh, within the next couple of weeks, Telcom are going to announce that they're going to bump those 384 line speeds up to 1 meg as well. Um, and so I cool. think that combination for the consumer is an absolute winner. You know, they're, getting, be they're getting a very good uh, product and price at the same time. Yes, I mean, yeah, the difference between 384 and 1 meg is significant. Yeah. Uh, it's also nice that, that you know the entry level prices are, are dropping so much. So hopefully, it's going to be a lot more people joining, you know, getting online. Um, and you, I know you can see overseas as more and more people get online, all the services that suddenly start being offered suddenly increase exponentially. Uh, so hopefully, we're going to start seeing that in the country. Yeah, I, mean, I think that was a big part of our thinking as well. You know, we're have, we have very much a fixed line player. Um, and what we've been seeing over the last couple of years is that the mobile guys are, are really growing quite exponentially. Um, and we've got, to, we've got to start gaining some of that ground back. So yeah. hopefully, as you say, you know, a, a well-priced product at a good speed um, will maybe get some people thinking that it's you know, either time to take a fixed line product for the first time or to actually switch back. Um, now, uh, one one thing that the guys have been wondering, if if I'm not mistaken, um, the the four meg and ten meg uncapped users haven't haven't uh, they didn't receive a price cut. Um, uh, why not? Yeah, we've uh, you know if you've been following our, on our Facebook page, there's been quite a lot of discussion around that. I think two things. The one is our four meg product, um, the shaped and the unshaped product are both very very competitively priced. They have been right from the outset. And, um, and just following some of the comments that were, you know, on the forums and, and, as I say, on our Facebook page, people were acknowledging that. They were saying, you know, it would have been nice if they got some price relief. I think every consumer would like to get price relief. But, you know, in terms of what they're getting right now, in terms of value for money and the experience they're getting, it is a very good product. 
so we chose not to do anything with the 4 meg product. And on the 10 meg product, uh, to be quite honest, we don't have a lot of customers on 10 meg yet. Um, and I think most That's ISPs fast. are in the same position. It's, you know, firstly, you've got to be able to get that sort of speed uh, mm. on, your, on your fixed line. And then, you know, I've noticed some of the, the other players have cut their pricing down to about 1,600 rand a month. I think that is still an expensive product for most consumers uh, yeah. and probably still beyond their reach. So, so we've decided not to do anything with them for now, um, but that's not to say we won't do something you know, going forward. We, we review our pricing at least quarterly across all of our product set, and if we think there's an opportunity to do something for those two products, we certainly will. Mm. Do, you, do you have an indication of how, you know, what the potential customer base is for 10 meg? You're talking about across the whole country? Yes, exactly. I mean, um, if you're saying that, that you're not seeing a lot of uptake, perhaps um, it's because not a lot of people have been converted to 10 meg. Um, no, I mean, you know, if I look at, at historically, our 10 meg pricing was, you know, on a par with everybody else's, if not cheaper. So, you know, we haven't seen a, a huge influx of customers to the 10 meg product, you know, over the last year and a half. Mm, well, since Telcom announced that, you know, they were making their 4 meg up to 10 meg. So I don't think it's a factor of our pricing right now. I just think historically, uh, you know, people just are either unable to get 10 meg. I, I think if you're able to get, you know, anything in excess of 4 megs on your current ADSL line, then you're, you're fortunate. Um, and then, you know, even as I say, even at anything above 1,500 rand, is still quite a pricey um, product yeah. for, for your average consumer. Also added to that, it you know, I know I have it. So normally when I want 10 megs, I'll just get two 4 meg accounts. Just because it's actually cheaper to you, yes, yes, and, and I have noticed with your guys' account, you, you hit five meg quite often uh, on down. So it effectively, you get you know for two four megs, you get the, the ten megs. Hmm. Um, yeah, you're you're in a, a position, I think. Yeah, and no, no, I'm very lucky, lucky where I am. I'm I'm quite aware how nice it is. <laughs> Um, then, then perhaps something uh, something that people don't know necessarily. Um, what is IPC? I mean, we were talking about these IPC cuts and and how they've enabled you uh, to to pass that benefit on. But but what is it exactly? Okay, so I mean, just in in layman's terms, basically what Telcom does is they aggregate your customers' um, last mile connectivity and they pull it together across their network and then they hand it over to you at a node somewhere on your network. Um, and, you know, in MWeb's case, we have three IPC nodes, so we, we get our customers uh, in Durban, in Cape Town, and Johannesburg. So, so wherever your customers connect from, you know, to their local telecom exchange, telecom then pool those connections to, you know, to, I think, somewhere in the region of about 50 uh, edge server routers, ESRs, that sit on their network, and then from there, they hand it over again uh, to the ISP. And then from there, the ISP... Um, you know, take their customer in, onto national and international bandwidth. They break you out onto the internet effectively. Mm -hmm. So what Telcom has done now is the cost of, of aggregating those connections and, and passing it over to the ISP, they've cut that cost by 30%, which is significant. Mm. So it's a, a major portion of any ISP's input cost. Okay. And um, uh, I don't know if I'm mistaken if, if uh, I mean, a week has passed, but um, you haven't announced price cuts for capped customers yet. Is that something that's going to happen? Sorry, I didn't hear the, the question. Uh, capped customers. Are you going to be looking at your capped products as well? No. Um, you know, our focus since um, March 2010 has been on uncapped. That's our strategy going forward, uh, and it's working for us. So... So our focus is, you know, primarily on, on driving benefit and experience for the cap, uh, for the uncapped base. Um, our cap products are very well priced. Now I think what we, what you're seeing with cap pricing is it's it's starting to bottom out now. It, it has almost become a race to the bottom. So I don't think the pricing on cap products is a barrier to entry anymore. Um, they are well priced across the industry. Um, so our focus is really about about uncapped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, 199 rand one megabit per second uncapped product. That's good. That's fairly entry great. level. Can't yeah. really argue with that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, some questions we've received from social channels uh, last week already, um, uh, and hopefully this is, this is a nice quick one because I, I think you've effectively answered it, but will, um, will Telcom's possible increase in DSL line speeds be passed on to all ISPs who manage the DSL services on behalf of their customers? Uh, yes, it will be. I mean, uh, the, the access 
um, charges are, are tariffs that are regulated by CASA, so Telcom would have to pass those benefit, benefits on to everybody in a consistent manner. So, so yeah, that is that is something to look forward to, I hope, in the very near future. Cool. And then uh, up the, the, the question that uh, I think we get most frequently, and it doesn't matter which forum you're on, this is the question that comes up, but when will uncapped ADSL coupled with a fast connection be available at prices comparable to what we see overseas? Uh, and then they list an example where, for example, in, uh, in the UK, you can get uncapped with uh, 17 megabit per second line, it seems, for 17 pound a month is the, the type of example. 200 grand. Yeah. Oh, 250 grand. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad they used the UK example and not uh, and not South Korea, where you can probably get it, you know, up to 100 megabits per second for even cheaper. Yes, um, yeah. Yeah, I guess that's the million dollar question. I think we must be realistic about this. I think it's still probably some way off, um, you know. And I think there's a couple of things to look at. The one is, is in terms of speed. When will we get to a, a point in time where the average speed on our, you know, ADSL infrastructure is on a par with, with uh, Europe and the UK? Telcom's just announced that they, you know, they're about to embark on a, a fairly big overhaul and upgrade of their of their platform, which is going to take somewhere in the region of two to three years. Uh, and then when we get to that point, they're able to then offer, you know, your ADSL 2 Plus and PDSL services, which take you, you know, theoretically to speeds from, you know, 40 megabits per second up to as much as 100 megabits per second. But that's a massive, massive, you know, infrastructure project that they're going to kick off now. And it'll it'll unfold over a period of time, but you know, as I say, that's a two to three year project, a very big project. So, from a speed perspective, um, we've got some way to go, and we don't seem to have yet a commercial model for fiber to the home. So, so you would expect that if anything is going to happen on the fiber front, it's probably also going to take somewhere in the region of two to three years. Mm, mm. And then from a cost perspective, um, you know, national international bandwidth's not the problem anymore. We've got a We've got a glut of, of international capacity at very good pricing now. I think the problem is still on national bandwidth, and then, you know, your last mile is expensive. So I don't know if, if fiber to the home and possibly LTE um, takes the sort of lead and the just competitive pressure of pricing on those services maybe drives down ADSL pricing, but, but I think we're still probably, you know, somewhere in the region of two to three years away before we get to that kind of pricing and speed that you mentioned in your question. Mm -hmm. Um, and while we're Having on the... That, I mean, let me yeah. modify that. I think, you know, if you'd asked two years ago, would we be sitting today looking at a, you know, a sort of scenario where uncapped was becoming the norm and the entry-level product in the market was one megabits per second, you would have probably said it's unlikely, and yet look where we are today. So, mm. you know, there's always surprises in the market, and uh, and if you've got the, the, the will to make things change, you can uh, you can drive a lot. So, so I think worst-case scenario, let's say two years. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and another question we've received in IRC, uh, and then um, I'll, I'll, I wanted to ask some technical questions after that. Um, uh, on the topic of the, the 20 and 40 megabit per second lines that, that Telcom is rolling out, that ZTE is holding up at the moment, um, uh, do, do, you have, uh, do you have plans to, to launch products um, on that speed already? Is that something that, that you've already started investigating? Sorry, I didn't hear the last part of the question. Uh, on the 20 meg product? Um, on the 20 and 40 megabit per second uh, product, uh, have you started investigating a business case, a product for those kinds of speeds yet? Uh, no, we haven't. Um, and, and we're talking about you know, a single circuit, obviously not looking at sort of bonded solutions. Hmm. Um, but we haven't. Uh, Telcom has recently informed us that they're about to start doing a technical uh, sort of proof of concept or commercial, uh, non-commercial trial with, uh, with higher speed products. And we'd obviously love to be a part of that. So we have actually expressed our, our interest in participating in that um, so that we can understand exactly, you know, how the traffic will flow over the network and, and how to do you know, traffic management, et cetera, and then how to turn that into a commercial model that makes sense for the consumer. Yeah, yeah. Um, then, then some more technical questions based on, on the stuff that uh, has happened in the last couple of weeks. ICASA um, has confirmed the launch date of Bitstream for November this year. Um, have you got an idea of how Bitstream will impact your customers? Um, what, will, what will you do with Bitstream access? Yeah, okay. So, you know, I don't want to get it too far out of my depth here because I'm not a technical person, but, you know, there's various flavors of Bitstream. There's various ways you can deploy a Bitstream solution, and I think a lot will depend on, on how it will actually be technically uh, deployed. 
and because it has also indicated that they want to put an industry working group together to work with telecom and themselves to determine the best way of doing it. Um, but in theory, I think the benefits as far as, you know, Bitstream versus IPC, um, the one is it should, from an ISP perspective, be a cheaper solution because, you know, you're offloading traffic off telecoms network onto your ISP network, um, you know, uh, closer to the ISP, uh, in which case, you know, we should see some price relief there. But I think the real benefit with Bitstream is that, from an ISP perspective, we have greater control over the end user experience because we're now able to determine, you know, things like traffic protocol and priorities and contention ratios. We can set those parameters. And um, and ultimately what that means is you should start seeing a lot more innovation in terms of the product offerings coming out of the various ISPs. So from a consumer perspective, you know, that's obviously a benefit to them as well. Mm-hmm. Um, then... Um, the, this next question is a bit long, so I'm, gonna, I'm, hope, I'm hoping it gets through to you clearly. Um, ICASA said it needs to look at standards before Bitstream can launch, hence the November 12, 2012 launch date. Uh, do you know if this implies that they'll be allowing for handover at the DSLAM? Um, and is this a feature that you'll be interested in using? Yeah, you know, just kind of following on from what I said earlier, it, it all depends on how much of the, the last or the local loop, loop you actually unbundle. You know, Bitstream, you can take all the way down to a DSLAN level. Um, I think at this stage, you know, that isn't something that we would support. We would prefer to, um, you know, to uh, take Bitstream down to the, what they call IP Bitstream. So effectively, um, you know, the traffic gets handed over to us on a, a on a ESR that sits on our network as opposed to sitting on telecoms network. I think the benefit of that is it allows your ISPs to get uh, used to the new way of managing traffic on their network. But in addition to that, the capital outlay for your ISPs is far smaller. If you're um, if you are getting the traffic handed over to you at three or four nodes as opposed to you know the DSLAM level telecoms with well over three thousand DSLAMs. And I think for expecting an ISP to go and put equipment down in all of those, you know, is, is fairly capital intensive. And I don't think too many ISPs would be in favor of that kind of model to start with. Mm-hmm. Then um, uh, we're in the home stretch. We've got some questions from, uh, from the IRC that, that I'd like to run through. Um, will MWeb uh, or is MWeb considering a rolling out in a last mile network? Um, as in a, a last mile wireless network or a fixed line network? Both, for that matter. Either, Both. as it were. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I think as far as uh, fixed line is concerned and, and traditional, you know, kind of ADSL or copper uh, fixed line, no, that's not something we'd uh, we'd be interested in. I think uh, um, you know, it's probably cost prohibitive, and the technology has kind of moved on. Um, we are always, you know, looking at options in terms of, of fiber, and we've We've investigated one or two you know, fiber to the home models, and we'll continue to do that on an ongoing basis. As things stand right now, there doesn't seem to be a commercially viable model to take fiber to the home. Uh, and then, as far as wireless is concerned, you know, I think the the topic that's on everyone's lips right now is what's going to happen with the spectrum allocation uh, for for WiMAX or LTE spectrum, and that is also something that we're uh, we're very much interested in. I think from you know any ISP would like to have complete control over you know the full uh, internet access service from the consumer right into the core of their network. So last mile is something that definitely interests us and something that we look at all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the um, the big thing with the spectrum assignments as they stand now is that uh, whoever whoever w- if if it were to go through as it is, whoever wins it will have to offer wholesale access. They will not be able to offer retail access directly, um, the, as I understand it, right? Uh, it depends on which, which bands you get uh, you bid for and, and you, you're successful in achieving. There are some bands that you can use on a, on a purely retail basis uh, for yourself, but, okay. uh, but there are others that you have to build an open access network and offer on a, a wholesale basis. A wholesale basis, yeah. Um, then, um, uh, I don't know how contentious a question this is, but is MWeb peering with Telcom? Um, you know, it's a, it's a question that's been asked before, and I'll give you the, the answer that we always have to do. With all our peering agreements, not just with Telecom, you know, we sign fairly strict uh, non-disclosure agreements with the other uh, Telecom operators or the, the uh, 
telco operators. And so I can't confirm whether we are or not, but I think, you know, for the, the technically minded, you can go and have a look and do a, a trace route on traffic and you'll be able to answer that question for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> which, I yes. think, which I think has been done. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, no, that's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, where do you think the future lies? In lower uncapped pricing or less contention or maybe something else? I think it's a bit of both. I think, you know, from a, from a consumer perspective, the, the South African consumer is still paying too much for their data. So there must be a concerted effort, effort by the industry players and by government to find a way to keep driving down the costs of, of Internet access. Um, but I think increasingly now, as pricing is starting to come down and there's definitely momentum there, I think we now need to look at how do we start getting the speeds up to the kind of levels that you know, people are experiencing in the first world. So you'll probably start seeing a skew towards towards speed, I would imagine. Mm, mm. All right. Um, I, I don't know if I've missed any questions. I was early. I was up in the in the IRC stream, so um, I don't see any more. So if I've couple, missed couple any. ones. Okay. Uh, yeah. the, the one is: Do you see any uh, chance that we're going to finally, at some point, be able to remove the voice component from our ADSL lines? Naked uh, ADSL. Basically, yeah, naked ADSL. I think it will happen. It's a question of, of when. You know, this is something that uh, last year uh, we advocated quite strongly for it. Uh, at one of the ACASA hearings, um, Telcom's argument is that there's this access deficit and that they're having to use the revenues from, from voice services to subsidize the cost of, uh, of data services. ACASA has indicated that they'll do a full study into that to actually determine whether that is the case and to what extent, and then they'll have to look at some way of, uh, of funding that deficit. But I think over time it, it will happen. Um, you know, you will be able to buy a standalone data circuit or service from... Good. Mm. Um, oh, uh, I'm sorry, there, there, I know there's uh, other questions, but a follow-on question to that is that ICASA, along with the announcement of Bitstream, says it is looking at the access line deficit in, in the context of, of Bitstream as well. Um, uh, why, why is that, do you think? Yeah, it does seem a bit of an improbable association. I mean, the two seem completely unrelated, and we've, uh, you know, we've been scratching our heads on that one too. I think... You know, I think there's two issues again. The one is, you know, let's first establish whether or not there really is this access deficit. Um, and uh, and should there be one? You know, should an efficient operator um, be able to claim that there is an access deficit? I think let's put that one to bed first. Possibly the one the one scenario that's been banded about that I've seen is that, um, that people are suggesting that because ICASA have linked these two, that possibly uh, some of the access deficit right now has been funded out of the IPC costs. And so by moving away from an IPC model to a bitstream model, you've got to incorporate, you know, some of that access deficit funding out of the bitstream model as well. Um, it does seem a little bit puzzling. So at the moment, I think it's just largely conjecture. We'll have to wait and see for these working groups to be established before we can actually understand what the rationale is behind that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there was uh, more questions. Yeah, what, you, okay, you've actually answered the one question, was, which was about the access line deficit. Okay. Uh, then the second one, uh, well, the last one that I have is, uh, has Pinky made a difference in the ADSL market at all? That's Pinky Moholy, uh, yeah. uh, head of Telcom. Has she made an interest? A I difference, mean, a, a difference. difference. And have you guys noticed a difference since she's taken the helm? Taken the helm. We have. I think she has made a difference. I think. Um, I think. You know, she had a lot of uh, internal political issues to deal with, which she would have appeared to have done. Um, which is important because she's got to run that business, and it's difficult to do if there's constant you know, political infighting going on. Uh, so that's the first thing, um, and and she's made some really tough decisions around getting rid of some of you know Telcom's previous bad investments, which had to be done as well. Uh, and the focus is now very much on the South African market, which is where it should be. Uh, so yeah, I would say she has made a difference. I think also just this this recent announcement of the amount of money they're going to be spending in the you know upgrading their fixed line infrastructure um, is also a very clear ind indication that she does appreciate and, and value the. Um, the network and the infrastructure they've got. I think you know they're going to continue playing in the mobile space through ATA, but they're not neglecting ADSL. And I think that's a very encouraging sign to yeah. the industry as a whole. So, so all around, I think she's she's on the right track. Mm -hmm. uh, Derek, with that, um, do you want to ask about the void? Um, sure. I, I don't. Um, uh, we we ran an article uh, earlier this week, I think, yeah. about about your your recent about a void product. Um, yeah. uh, can can you run us through that? Yeah, look, we've, we've offered VoIP services for a, 
close to two years now. Um, and, and strangely enough, our focus has been on the wholesale side and not so much on the retail side. Uh, but I think we just didn't pay enough attention to it because you know we've been really preoccupied with, with getting ADSL right. Uh, but we have a very good ADSL customer base, uh, right through from residential users through Soho into SME and even into sort of mid-tier and small corporates. And, um, and increasingly, there's just a demand for VoIP services, and we're seeing it across the, the, the spectrum of all the markets we play in. Uh, so we've spent some time upgrading the platform that we operate and, um, and getting our product set sorted out. I think from a consumer perspective, they're really looking for a plug-and-play solution. You don't want to be yes. putting, typing in SIP codes and, and mm. all sorts of things into a, into a mobile device. And so there's been a big focus around that, and we will hopefully go to market within the next month or two with our revised consumer offering. And then something similar on the, the business side for your SMEs. So, you, yeah. um, so we're doing well. The, the base is growing nicely and uh, the traffic on the network is growing nicely as well. And it's definitely a space we want to be in. Um, uh, just a quick question. You're saying that you know, where people don't want to put those codes into their phones. Will you possibly be offering clients for the Android and, and other phones? So I, yeah, I just see yeah, that as one of the big problems. So we, we, we use SIP quite a bit and the clients out there yeah. are shocking. <laughs> Yeah, we've got a mobile client now for the um, for uh, Apple, for Android, and for Symbian for the Nokia awesome. phone. So we've got check three. That's really cool. Yeah. Very cool. Derek, with that, um, thank you very much for your time. Um, is, uh, if you have any last words, something something cool that's coming up, or, or something that we might have missed, uh, now's the time to say it. Otherwise, uh, or, or, or do you want to direct our lis- listeners anyway? Yeah. Some. Yeah. No, look, I think, um, you know, this is a, a great show and a, and a great concept, guys. And, and, and once again, I think I've said this to you before, Jan, or, or to Rudolf, you know, the support that you guys give to the industry is fantastic. And, um, you know, if guys have got questions or, co- or comments uh, about MWeb or the industry as a whole, we've got two great social media channels on our, our Facebook page and our Free the Web page, and, you know, we'd love to hear from them. So, so drop us a line, and, and we'll be more than happy to oblige with a response. Yeah, cool. Thank you All very right. much. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Cheers. Have a good evening. You too. All right. <laughs> All right. And with that, um, I think it's time for some introductions. I'm Jan Vermeulen. Tim Hogg. And I'm Gerrit Vermeulen. We host the show. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Uh, Half an hour in. We just had to make sure the calls went through clearly and all the rest of it. And uh, we wanted to have no technical issues. So. Yes, yeah. So uh, I think a very, very enlightening interview with Derek Hershaw. Awesome. That was really, really very, good. Very, very good. Yeah. But well done, Jan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you. Dates? Um, Events coming up, yeah. So, first up, uh, Ubuntu 12.04 is coming out tomorrow. Yep. Woo! Get your torrent clients running. Oh, uh, you don't even need the torrent clients. You can torrent just client is the fastest. Is I've it? realized. Okay. There is a direct link for, for it and a couple of servers. So, they have a whole bunch of mirrors, probably a South African mirror as well. But from my experience, if you're downloading it, just go for the torrent. And then seed while you're at it. <laughs> yes, because you can. Having said that, I've already mirrored the repositories uh, for the X, the 64-bit ones. Oh, cool. So that, mm, um, that we, we've used. been playing around quite a bit. Well, it's lovely when you've mirrored because you can leave it through the night. And then as you're installing packages, you go, install. And it just goes, <laughs> zoof. There. It is lovely. And it's, it's actually quite small. It came to about 10 gigs. But look, I'm looking only at, uh, what's it called? I want to call it Precious. It's not Precious. It's P. Pangolin. Pangolin. Oh, are you doing about Precise. Ubuntu? Precise. 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 Yes. Sorry, I went blank on the name there. Uh, Precise. And then I'm only doing the um, 64-bit ones. But it works quite nicely. Cool. Yeah, so that's coming out. There is a launch party for Pretoria um, from the Ubuntu group. You can check that out. They have uh, an invite on Facebook, I think, um, where they'll be, yeah, take your drives with if you don't want to or if you, don't, if you can't uh, download the either ISO or anything like that, take a drive, take a USB disk, a flash disk, or an actual CD, and one of the guys there will be happy to help you out. But, so it still fits on a CD? You don't need yeah. a DVD? Yes, or this one still fits on a CD. Um, I'm not I, sure I about do 1210, though. That, no. that might be moving oh, yeah. over to DVD. All of the 1204s are all fit on a CD, because mm. be, we've, we've actually been testing them in, in uh, oh, okay. work you've quite a bit. Yeah. You've been doing the beta. Uh, but I more, a lot, uh, and I've been using the server quite a bit. Okay. Uh, and the server is lovely. It's fast. It, well, it boots faster than any of the others so far. It is really, really Good nice. Um, they do have a DVD option one, and I think that just comes with more packages. Okay, yeah. 
Mm. Then uh, the other thing happening on the 14th of May, or I should, I should say the, the midnight of the 15th of May, um, is Diablo 3's launch in South Africa. Two weeks. Yep. Kalahari is having one in Cape Town. BT Games is having some uh, in various stores across the country, if I'm not mistaken. So Kalahari's launch looks like quite a party. They've got a live band and wow. all, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Are, you, are, are you off there? No, no, no. I'll be, does, I'll be sound asleep. Does Kalahari uh, what do you this? mean you're going to be sound asleep? I'm going to be up at 12. <laughs> I'm going to play. <laughs> I have work the next day. <laughs> I know, but look, I'm going to play for half an hour and then go to sleep. But I, I just, I have to. Yeah, yeah. It's required. Indeed, indeed. So, yeah, those are the, uh, those are the upcoming events that we know of. Um, you went to a beer festival this weekend. Yes. How, how did that go? Awesome. Very, very cool. Um, lots of beers. Um, I can see the chocolates that were so popular last year. They had about six or seven ones this year. Um, going around, uh, let's see, the most interesting beers I had, the most interesting beer was a nettle beer, which has no, well, very little hops. supposed to have no hops in it, but effectively they use stinging nettles as a hops replacement. It was surprisingly nice. Mm, mm. Um, uh, uh, the other beers that were quite nice there were SAP. Uh, they've got their own microbrewery, uh, not not for sale, but just for the internal uh, brewers from their side to make some stuff. And they had three beers there. All three were awesome. Uh, they had a, what do call it, a cloudy, a, uh, ah, cloudy something, a red ale and a chocolate stout. Very, very good. Cool. Uh, and then one more event coming up, which isn't under the events section. I'm pasting it up now, and then I'll link everybody in the IRC. Is Ubuntu 12.10? Well, yeah, that's that's been given a, a date and a name. Yes. Um, and I can't remember the date now. It's the uh, 18th of October. 18th of October. Okay, yep. so there's and 12.10. Qu- Quantal, I don't even know how to say this animal's name. Quantal uh, Quetzal. Is it a bird? Quetzal, yes. It's a very, very colorful bird. Uh I think there's... Are they overhauling the it, UI again? Isn't there also... Yes. Oh, the pay. Well, so I, I think they're going to try and pretty it up. Uh, so they're probably sticking with Unity. Look, I don't see them moving from Unity anytime soon. I, 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 I've decided with this new release, I'm downloading server. I'm going to install server on my desktop. <laughs> and then I'm going to install the desktop that suits me. Because I'm sick and tired of getting it, uninstalling all, all the stuff, yeah. and, and reinstalling their desktop. Uh, the ones to look out for Cinnamon, which is... Cinnamon really, nice. still yeah. a bit unstable. That's uh, based on GNOME two, is it? GNOME three. GNOME 3. Actually, uses GNOME three underline, okay. and they basically try to do a hybrid of GNOME three and two. So keep all the things that people like from GNOME two, mm-hmm. but give you some of the new functionality that's born out of GNOME. It comes with GNOME three. Three. Okay. Um, and this is done by the guys who do the Mint uh, Mint Linux distro are, are driving it quite. A, it is really nice. It, it, look, just be aware it's unstable, um, but it is. I prefer using that unstable version on multi desktop than Unity. Uh, I, I, though I'm still actually using XFCE. Just it, it works. It just it works and it works. Uh, my brain knows where to find things. Multi desktop is a problem. I actually tried it uh, on my home machine for a bit. It works, but it has a weird graphical glitch in the bottom of my main screen because they're not the same size. I know how to fix that. Fantastic. I'll uh, chat to you later. A, a quick tip is if you're having problems with multi desktop and Ubuntu. Um, just check either sliding the, the smaller screen all the way to the top or all the way to the bottom. I have seen that it, it, it like changes as they update it. But if you get, get it right, I think at the, if it's all the way at the bottom works, um, suddenly all, all the problems go away. Uh, my main Strange. problem, though, is like I'll tab and task switching on multi desktop is just painfully slow. Yeah. Yes. It, it hurts. Yes, it does. And, and starting apps is slow. So it just I haven't noticed that. Um, of course, wait, 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 go back to XFC, and it's like suddenly everything just goes zoop, zoop, and it's there. Um, yes, yeah, somebody's also saying twelve or four is the long term release long-term support, support edition. Yeah, release. So that's five every years. two years. That oh yeah, every two years they release one. I think yes, yes, um, and, and then, then its support is up to five years for the server, for the server for the ser- server build, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's longer than five years. I could be wrong. I'll okay. have to check it. We'll yeah. have to check it again. But yes. it's long. It's it, long and the desk and the desk release for both. Um, basically, they're giving you all the security updates and kernel updates, mm. and they'll keep on um, doing that for quite a while. Cool. While we're on the topic of Linux, there was a comment from the IRC, which I think is worth discussing, which is that Steam for Linux has been confirmed. Awesome by Valve. Yes. Yes. And on I, I, on the Twitter face, obviously, I saw naturally on Twitter. Uh, a comment on, on Google on Plus. Yes. 
uh, but I, there, there wasn't a link to confirm whatever the guy said. He said that Left 4 Dead 2 will be one of the first games ported. Uh, does anyone have any kind of confirmation for that? Or is that just a rumor? Um, yeah, they, they did uh, say that Valve's they're busy porting Valve games over would, to Linux. It would make sense because, I mean, Mac and Linux are, I mean, fairly close together in terms of the technology that they need to use. Yeah. I mean, mm. they're going to need to use OpenGL. They can't use DirectX. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so Left 4 Dead, those, those Valve games, Half-Life, those games already run on, on, on Mac. Mac. Um, and if Valve wants to bring Steam to Linux, then at the very least... Especially Team Fortress, man. That's such a cool, quirky game. I'm sure the the, the, the Linux lot will love it. So it, it's Linux. It run. It gives you far more resources. So you know, once to actually do this. Sorry, we, we've just been having a lot of fun with Windows servers recently running at when <laughs> when, when, when 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 Windows hits eighty percent or higher, it falls over often. You can when, ask Harriet about this. When it hits sixty percent for forty five minutes. It locks up completely. I had good fun today. <laughs> <laughs> so just so we was you streaming the cast hearing today? We're just having fun with Windows. I, I, I know, I know, it's fun to rag on Windows. I like to rag on Mac a little bit. What I've now done on my Mac, um, Syracuse, who writes for Ars Technica, yes, um, the legend, the legend who wrote like a twelve thousand, the man who does the Mac OS X reviews, like twelve thousand word epic of a review. Yes. Um, anyway, he he tweeted a link to how to get your Mac to perform better, and he's like, you do it at completely at your own risk. Um, apparently, Max Pager. So while Windows might like fail under under processor load, mm. Mac cannot handle memory load. As soon Sounds as my right, RAM yeah. starts filling out, um, it actually favors paging out to the disk over just blatting something from RAM yes. and then putting something. What? I, I don't understand it either. So what I've now done <laughs> is I've essentially turned off paging. It's not quite off, but it is it is so conservative now. I do not page back. Do you have a sysctl file? Can That's you exactly what I did. So I, I sudoed something. Um, I'll, I'll read the command line now for the geeks out there. I sudoed something, copy pasted, literally copy pasted the command because it was late and I mm. just needed it to get done. Rebooted my machine and it's a pleasure to use. It's unbelievable that my machine is actually usable again. Um, so now and again, things, things are a little slow, especially when I launch and, you know, when the RAM is full and I launch a brand new app. Mm. That that like now it took it thirty seconds to launch terminal. It's odd that you wow. should mention this on, on my my server at home where I do most of our rendering for this thing, which is sixteen gigs of RAM. I've been having a lot of problems with hard drive lately. Where it's just been going flat out. I removed my page file. It's such a beauty to use. Yeah, yeah. Um, look, it's it's uh, on Mac. It's launch CTL. So I sudo launch CTL unload the dynamic page appeal list file. Okay. Done. <laughs> uh, Linux is by dynamic pager. <laughs> <laughs> it's far easier. You just cat into prox syscurn. Ah, uh, what's it this? This is a geek show, people. Keep up. Anyway, but, but, but <laughs> Google the page file. And basically, you change. You can actually set the percentage of how when it's going to start trying to page things out. So, so say like on servers, you want to set to eighty percent. You want to page out quite quickly to, to leave as much working memory as possible. But on desktops, you want to set it to like down at ten percent. Um, and it actually makes a huge, huge difference. Um, there's even some things to actually, if you want to kick everything out of page files, that you can even do. Mm -hmm. anyway, and uh, yes. while, we're, uh, while we're on the topic of Linux, let's keep going. Um, the Lightworks is, was demoed on Linux. Yeah, uh, demoed on Ubuntu, I believe. Uh, Lightworks, for those who don't know, is video editing software. Um, good. Video good video editing software. It is Hallelujah. currently, as I understand it, in beta. And... It has got, it's won a couple of awards. It's been used in a couple of big productions. Shut up and take my money. Yeah, exactly. And that's what uh, a lot of the Linux community is saying is shut up, take my money and give me this awesome software. Uh, if it's it, one thing Linux needs. It's also they have a shock. Do they have a flying shock? Look, look, the bottom left <laughs> corner, they have a shock. <laughs> I want it. And uh, it, it's also, if it's not already, it's also going to be open sourced, uh, at least uh, core parts of it and then some parts of it are well, yeah, probably yeah. proprietary proprietary there we go but yes it's been demoed so it's definitely on its way uh, it is a bit late i think they promised that at the end of last year and it's or you know quarter one of this year around there somewhere and we're still kind of waiting so i mean iris you asked why are we not using ssds as a primary drive um, on that server originally had an ssd it made stuff all difference except to boot no difference I, I Look, I've got For so, paging. I have so much RAM in that machine 
So when it's pa- – it should never be paging. Yes. It should not be paging. So when it's paging, something in Windows has decided to start writing to the disk, which it should not be doing. Yes. Um, so I, if I it starts paging, it's actually thrashing. Yeah. <laughs> so now I could imagine if, if, you know, if I had four, four, four gigs of RAM, SSD would be great. Um, I tried with the video editing – it, the, the disc made no difference. So I've actually then took the disc, put it into another machine, um, and there it's working beautifully. Mm. Um, I have said that I know for our main mixing PC, we've got an SSD for our primary drive uh, to aid and boot. So w- when Windows does crash, we back up and running as quickly as possible. Notice he said when. <laughs> yes, sorry. <laughs> I, I know we're bashing. All, look, all of these have. Look, we, I, I, I know. Think we have now successfully bashed. Windows, Mac, and Linux tonight. Yes, and I can also bash Ubuntu because every now and then it does a, 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 the disk thrash of death. They've did something in, in 11... On the server side now? No, on the desktop, desktop. Oh, desktop. Every now and again, your, your drive... And one of the things that... I remember in 11, I actually stopped using Ubuntu at that you, stage. You uninstall the Ubuntu one and it actually fixes yes, quite remember, a bit of it. I remember that. Um, oh, really? So, yes. Hmm. Try it. I'm, I'm actually using Ubuntu one now because it's, according to me, the second best uh, actual cloud storage. Well, there were, there were two it's, things that I had to do to fix it. The, the first client. one was to move Ubuntu 1, which decreased the chance that would this occur. Mm-hmm. Um, it does seem to be related to Chrome when you have lots of tabs. Um, and the second thing I did, which has made it go totally away, that SSD drive that was free is now my laptop. Um, <laughs> and strangely enough, didn't, uh, I think uh, it, it fixed the, the thrash of death. Audio dips. There is more stuff to say about Linux, but I think we should leave that for the end of the show. So yeah. for now, um, just a quick mention of 227, um, who recently uh, had awesome an event. Banking for, monitoring. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, money monitoring service. Yeah, personal financial management is what That's it's called in industry. Um, they call themselves a, b- a behavioral science um, service. So effectively... Um, helping you manage your money through behavioral science because smart people do dumb stuff with their money. Um, and um, it's, um, yeah, and so they're going to come out of beta. Cool. Uh, they, they say that they're not um, announcing specific timelines just yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, it, um, yeah, they're, they're not announcing specific timelines yet. And, um, but once they announce it, people will be given a 30-day countdown clock thingy. Yeah. So maybe it'll be in a 30-day month. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, because it, um, you will get a free month of 22.7 if you sign up as a new user. So they're giving beta users that same free month effectively. Okay. Um, and then you'll have to start paying okay. 70 rand a month. To I have a service. question for you. Sure. I know you're quite a fan of this. Mm. Is it worth 70 rand a month? Uh, yes, and I say that for one reason. Everybody's reasons are going to differ, right? It's built on a bit of a promise, but I, I do. I have met these guys, and I do trust them. They're good guys working mm. on the technical side. Um, all my data in one place with all the associated uh, visualization tools and, and management tools to go with it. So I pull automatically all my data from all my financial institutions to one location, and it is stored forever. So since I started using 227, which was July last year or something, um, I don't have to go into a bank and pay them an obscene amount of money to pull a statement from July 2011. I can just go look at my data. True. Okay, I'm just going to put it in comparison to something else. I've sure. got a backup client now. Unlimited backup. Uh, I think it's 500 rand a year. Mm. That's going to cost me 800. Zovo. No, f- 500 rand for Zovo, and yeah. that's for the professional version. So yeah, yeah. I also have like a SFTP drive I can shove things into. Um, this client, this 2227, is going to cost me roughly called 800 rand a year. Yes. So it's, it's more for storage of less data. Yes. Um, of specific data. I mean, that, should be, that should, should be noted. I mean, because it's not just about storage of data, which is why, I mean, I did say that that's my main reason. Yeah. But what's cool about it is I can go, um, and what I'm hoping for, and it's a, it's a, it's a uh, service I, will, I hope becomes sort of standard, is that instead of going into the bank to pull a statement, I can go to 227, print it out, and just go have the bank stamp it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if they'll charge for that stamp. Maybe they'll yes. wisen up to it and say, oh, this is a 10 rand stamp. Badoof. Oh, no, they won't. They'll say that's on our accredited statement. I don't know where you got that. I'll have to print you one, which they'll, they'll charge you for. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, the problem is, is that if you, if you ask them to print me a statement from a year's transactions ago, they have to go pull it from archives. It takes them three days to do it or something oh, okay. ridiculous. Um, so, uh, I mean, that, that's well, one of the coolest look, things about I, the service. I, I think it's a very nice service. I just my, mine is eighty rand a month. Feels seventy rand a month feels a bit steep. 
Okay, yeah. That just, that's my personal. Sure, sure. Um, that's more than what I'm paying for my bank, what, what I'm paying my banks. Of course, I am with the cheap bank. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and uh, an interesting discussion we had last night, um, and this part I don't think is off the record. Uh, last night's discussions were, were, there were a lot of th- things said off the record, mm-hmm. um, which is a very dangerous thing to do around media. Um, but uh, I had a, um, a very cool discussion with a technical guy, Kenny, and um, who's a gamer. And so uh, we started talking about WoW uh, and its subscription model. But just because we were talking about gaming, we weren't actually talking about 22.7 at that stage. And um, something that he mentioned, which is actually quite true, is part of the reason people you know, go back to WoW and, and keep giving Blizzard their money, and, and perhaps we're happy to give Blizzard their money, is because they knew that that money would, would just get pumped right back into the game. I mean, obviously, they make, yeah. a, they make a huge amount of profit off of it, but um, they also plow a significant proportion of that money back into the game, release new content, and keep the game going. That's why WoW is still going today. That's why, you know, people launch Star Wars The Old Republic and Rift. Uh, Rift is apparently not doing so badly, but, you know, there's all these reports coming out about Star Wars The Old Republic, server mergers, populations are down, server populations are down, blah, blah, blah. And yet, wow, chugs along. And so, similarly so for 20 to 7, give them my 70 rand a month and, uh, you know, and with the, in trust that they're going to plow that back into the service and I'm going to get a cooler, a cooler way to, to see what I'm doing with my money. Um, and it's interesting what that does to you when you suddenly see, not just sort of see in a spreadsheet, when you see what you're doing with your money, you're going, what am I doing? Why am I blowing my money on this junk? Um, and, and, and I, I can, will ask you this question again in a year. Yeah, that's actually Because really that's good. actually the thing is, is quite often they show that initially you see it and go, oh, oh my, you know, how, how can they raise the price of petrol to 10 rand? You know, 12, after 22. No, no. Because remember when it first went to 10 rand, the first time? It was actually shot. But now it's at 12, and because it happens slower, um, eventually you, you sort of get used to it. So it, I'm going to check back in a year and see whether you sort of – if it is, great. Um, there are, are things by showing that. It's like measuring your weight all the time. It's supposed to help. Um, so it, it should work. Uh, it, uh, this is more my interest to see if it actually does. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And, um, and to be fair, I mean, while I'm all excited about uh, the aggregation aspect of it and being able to go back in time as far as I want without having to pay a stupid bank money to see what I've done mm. in the past or to uh, plot trends or whatever the case might be um, – uh, the uh, they only recently implemented Virgin Money support, and that um, is actually quite critical for me. Um, yeah. So now we'll see what does the service really mean for me. Cool, cool. Then some other cool stuff that happened this week uh, is it's, it, it's ZX Spectrum 30th anniversary. Uh, I don't know if anybody of you guys had one. We had one. It was awesome. It had lots of RAM, all 32k. <laughs> um, and you used to yes it looked just like that and then we like those watching two the video audio stream? jacks at the back of it and Whoa. you used to load programs on it with a tape recorder yes I remember um, those days and, and you would also have to get wow. these white noise tapes that you had to play on the thing and then it bite you you could tune the head up and down to get the, the sound correct to make sure that when you played the tape that it would actually have the, the correct fideli- fidelity to get your programs in um, and this was one of those things you, you would say you'd type Load, I think it was load, enter, and quickly push play. Um, so they, <laughs> <laughs> they, and then you'd go off and do something else for like three or four minutes. And then you come back and play your game. It was awesome. <laughs> Before my time. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, re- I remember Commodore gaming. So like uh, I, here I am in the Commodore camp. Um, before, I, I think we had actually just got a PC and other people in the family, they had a PC, but they bought the kids a Commodore. Mm. And they also had to load stuff from tape. And uh, there was this tank game. And you shoot, and then the bullets become solid. And your idea wasn't to blow up the other tank, as far as I remember. It was to trap him. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, like, you'd shoot the bullets, and I think they'd go a certain distance, and then they'd become solid. solid. And then, they, you know, like, eventually you'd trap the other guy, and then you win. Um, so, and also, I'm, I'm, I must say, like, by that time, we'd already had a PC in our home. And it seemed so archaic. Here I, I, I'm used to floppies, and here these guys are trying to load something from it. And you have to, lo- you have to first, you have to load a loader program, uh, and then load the, load the tape, and then you can l- load the program that you just loaded from the tape, and actually play something. But you know, th- these things were from the beginning. You know, th- there was no such thing as internet. There was no 
Um, so it's actually amazing how far it's come. Yeah. Very, very cool. In such a short time. It's yeah. incredible. Talking about amazing things, you, you're going to talk about this channel, is uh, Turing's rapid Nazi enigma code-breaking secrets revealed. Yep. And so apparently the agencies who sat on this, uh, and uh, I'll paste this, uh, this link into the, the IRC now. It's, uh, it's a, the register article. I love the tone of the register. Um, and um, the, uh, what, they've done, uh, what they've done was they kept this locked up but uh, recently told the BBC that they've squeezed it for all it was worth, and so now they're releasing it to the public domain. So I guess uh, basically what that means is that uh, in terms of modern crypto... Um, Don't base it on this. Yeah, this, well, well uh, this isn't worth much probably in, in modern... I mean, they, they've used it up until now because it was useful. Well, it's still amazing that it was useful until now. Yeah. Mm, and to me, that's amazing. He, he, laid, he laid what seemed to be the foundation for code cracking. So in other words, you know, where, where you, um, you sit, for example, in a modern day situation on a Wi-Fi network and you sniff the traffic. And then if you sniff enough encrypted traffic on, uh, on a thing with a weak key, yes. you can decrypt the key from that. That's basically the principle, you know, that they, that they speak about in the article. Um, so yeah, uh, the that is now available at the National Archive. Uh, that was donated to the National Archive of, in of Surrey, England. in yeah. England, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, if uh, you're interested in the history of code breaking and something, and code breaking that probably re uh, what they reckon reduced the length of the Second World War by two years or so, um, this is something to check out. And basically, the birth of computers. Um, because the, the Enigma the, machine, the yes. Enigma machine stuff that he built to break the encryption was, and a, a lot of the ideas he came up with were basically it's the Turing machines. Your, your basic concept in computer science of you know the basic machine. It was all his ideas that he came up with, um, and this is what y your modern PCs are based off of. Mm. Very very bright guy. Mm. Um, this comes from the GH, uh, GCHQ, which I don't know what that stands for according to the register article, um, but it's a mathematician. Uh, named only as Richard, who handed it over. It's very, uh, very on the on the down low. These uh, these cryptographic types. Yeah. Uh, another great thing that finally came out. We've been waiting for it. It's been you know. It's been rumored for so long. I, this has been rumored for years. I think. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. The worst thing, the worst thing. This actually there's two, but the the worst. I don't have it. <laughs> because when I went, it says, uh, we will notify you when it's available. Yeah. And we are talking about Google Drive. Yeah. Uh, by the way, the notify thing, if you go there, you click all the way through. Click on the uh, yes, notify me button, and then it'll pop up something, and then click on that button as well. Done. When, it, when I did that, it activated my service. <gasps> I borrow my VPN. <laughs> Maybe that works. <laughs> no, well, I've got so, yeah, and I've got VPNs. No, what I think it is, I think they're doing the same that did with uh, it's a Google Plus. Lot. Is that you, you find if you keep on trying – you might be the, into that lucky thing where they're mm. releasing it. But uh, it, it is a staggered rollout. Uh, yeah, it's really awesome. It's free. It's five gigs of, of storage. It's m supposed to be merging a lot of the storage. So it's working on the docs interface. Do you they give you referral bonuses like Dropbox? Doesn't look like it, no. But they do have some very well-priced, arguably, um, bump ups from that so you can bump yourself up to 20 gigs of storage which then automatically bumps your gmail storage up to 25 gigs and then there's another one for i think 50 or 100 and it goes up to something a like terabyte. a terabyte yeah. yeah the thing is if you do comparisons over the previous pricing which was yearly over the new pricing which is monthly the new pricing is significantly higher is hmm. it that's interesting hmm. because i know i pay more for storage for photos <coughs> which means I'm hopefully yeah, that, I will actually have the highest storage. That's the storage that I'm I'm kind of looking for, and I was looking at Picasso, but Picasso doesn't have a, a Linux client. Um, it does. I, no, they it's been deprecated. Um, oh, okay. Sorry, I know I did it once. So stage. they they did, but that is also not a native Linux client. That was just uh, a packaged wine. with wine. Oh, okay. It, uh, yeah. Look, having said that, just to talk, I know for the twenty five gigs it was about two rand seventy uh, two, two dollars uh, forty nine for Google Drive. Yeah. Uh, Two dollars forty nine, I think, per month to go up to twenty gigs, and that's fair. Which is I'm willing to pay good. that. And that brings us back to Linux, in that there's no Linux client. Google Drive doesn't have a Linux client yet. It has a Windows and a Mac client. That also doesn't have an iOS client. 
Yes, uh, I'm sure that that's actually been submitted. It just has to go through the approval they said, process. They said in the blog post they're working really hard on it. Yeah. So I don't so think it's done yet. Having okay. said it, should, Linux should be one of the easiest ones to write that client for. There are like 20 ones that are using using Fuse. So you see, we Fuse is a way of creating like a drive. Uh, going into Google Google Docs, Gmail, and all the rest of it. Mm. Oh, Which oh, is oh. effectively what Drive is. I mean, yes. all the, I've activated Drive. My Docs is gone. If I go to docs.google.com, it takes me to Drive. Yes. So all of a sudden, and the, the sorting feature, everything that I was used in Docs is gone. Um, yeah. So No, no. You can still... You I can't, can't sort by priority. My priority sort is gone. Oh, oops. Mm. <laughs> well... Tell them about it. <laughs> Notify them that you want that feature back. What, what's more interesting, do you think Dropbox is going to up, up, up its free amount? It might. Uh, 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 Dropbox's starting amount is five two, gigs. Two, two, two gigs. Two gigs. Okay. But they did up the referral amount to 500 megs. A time, and you, per, can, get one and you can get up to a ridiculous amount. So yeah. that's, that, that's, that's, that's a point. Even with, I think I have like three or so referrals, I only have 3.2 gigs on Dropbox. I have eight point something gigs. In Dropbox, and that's the thing that Google Drive is competing with: is people, you know, like us who have been using it for a while. We already have our stuff in Dropbox. We don't really want to move away. I don't want to give eight gigs of space up. Just so much. Well, more. I have Dropbox. It's all linked in now. So it's all I, I have it linked it's to servers everywhere. Exactly. I have it working. Or my 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 parents have it. That I've taught them how to use that it. Command line client for Dropbox is. Is lovely. Mm. Uh, anybody who doesn't know this, you can run a command line Dropbox. So on a get. server, a headless server, you you can have Dropbox on it, yes. and you have no idea how this is how useful this is until you have it. You can drop files in. So I have scripts that automatically run as files arrive, and will drop files also into Dropbox for me to get them. So I I know now almost have a remote uh, way of speaking to to my server <laughs> that that works almost everywhere. It is great. I don't need SSH clients. I don't need anything. Mm. Drop it in there. It drops, appears on the other side and goes. Awesome. And uh, you can, I don't know uh, if they'll, uh, how long they'll let you do this, but I mean, you could effectively host your whole website in Dropbox then. By I could actually. By yeah. making a sim link from yeah, make www to Dropbox. Yep. But why, why would they not allow you? Why would well, they? if you ream them traffic wise, no. they might go. Well, eh. which, websites tend to be rather static. Yeah, I guess most of the punishment is still going to be taken by your server. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, all of it's by your server. Yeah, yeah. So that's but just for, that just links it if you're making changes to it. And yeah, it yeah. makes it ridiculously easy to make changes then. Mm. Having said that, I still use Git for that. Mm. Mm. And I, I remember reading something uh, from an indie dev who managed to get, who, who basically, he didn't want to run a server permanently. So he actually managed to point a torrent at Dropbox. Mm -hmm. And so he hosts his whole game download out of Dropbox. Well, they do have a max limit for free accounts yeah. uh, with, with traffic. But if you're an indie dev, mm. maybe he's not getting that much traffic. It is, I mean, the, the cap for that is high. Plus, the whole point is, I mean, with torrents is your initial seeding amount is going to be a lot. But then hopefully as it gets more popular, there'll be more people, can, yeah. you know, taking the load off Dropbox. Mm. Yeah. Cool. That brings us into the kicker. What do cool. we have? We have Tetris. On a building. Yes. So it's another it's great Russian invention. Yes. Um, Along with the Kalashnikov. Some of the you, guys Russia. at MIT turned a building called the Green Building into a Tetris game. That is awesome. What did they control it with? Did they say? I didn't read. I looked at the pictures and went, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I want that. <laughs> Control it with a connect. Well, imagine, oh, you know, no, no, well, basically, you need to have uh, a building control system. Um, and that's basically just turning lights on and off. Mm -hmm. And then you just need to run around and basically change the light bulbs. But, and then once you've done that, you, you control it from a PC. Yep. Mm. Very cool. So, um, I, like, I don't know. These are the things that interest me. Do they, they have different colored? It looks like they've got different colored lights in each of those rooms. Yes. So that they can... For the blocks. Yeah, so yeah. that they can... The other way of doing it is you would have to like do an LED lighting system with Wi-Fi. That would work. Sorry, just thinking how I would do it. Yes. Okay. Now, this is um, like how... What are the facilities management systems or whatever you want to call them? This is a great way to abuse one. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's when you start thanking everybody that you don't pay for your lights. 
<laughs> that's just part of your league. No, but look, I think uh, from together that they've got the media lab there. We basically, and it's they, they encourage the people to do things like this. And I always think that's one of the problems in this country. We don't encourage people to go out and do these crazy things because imagine all the things you learn in doing this. Mm. You're gonna have to write control systems. You're gonna have to write, you know, things to change the colors of the lights. I mean, I left Varsity and I had no idea how these how these uh, facilities managing uh, management systems uh, worked. And basically, by doing the, these great projects, Skader. Skater, yes. That's one of the um, words I'm looking for. The guys come out learning these things, and, and yes, it looks stupid there, but it looks now awesome you, there. you, well, <laughs> it, you know, the guys, you get a lot of the people in the country, you look, they're wasting their time, wasting yeah. power. But in a way, you can use that then to learn how to save power. They've now automated the entire building. Mm -hmm. So you can now go off and say at night, um, check if somebody's inside, turn all the lights off. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Indeed. Go green power <laughs> on the green building. <laughs> cool. And for that. We're at the end of the show. That's our show, I think. Yep. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you to Derek, um, yeah. who we let get some sleep. And, uh, and so let's run through. Where can people find you? They can find me on about.me slash Hawkeys ZA. Uh, at Tim Hawk on Twitter. Cool. Anywhere else? Nah, not really. <laughs> I am, uh, as, as Tim is here on Let's Talk Geek, I am on my broadband. .co .za. I'm, a, I'm a staff writer there. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter, YanVZA, and on Google+, Plus, though it's been very busy lately. Cool. So, yeah. Yeah, I've Having said that, please go like us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Plus, whatever your poison is. If you're on all of them, please. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, that way we'll also we, – we, we tweet out – uh, as the shows go live, I've not been very good about announcing on Google Plus when the shows go live. Maybe I should start doing that. Yeah, um, I don't know if we do that on Let's Look Geek. We tend not to announce on those because I, I don't get a lot of feedback. Though I do put quish like when we had uh, Derek on, I yes. did put questions and show, the place that I actually I got no feedback on Facebook and I got a lot of feedback on Google Plus. Google Plus. So, but I'll, I'll use both and I use that on Twitter. Uh, we do post our videos when they're released on all on all media all channels. Cool. Yep. So uh, if you want to keep up to date, that's the place to do it. Uh, you can check out our other shows. We've got Let's Talk Possibility on Monday, Monday nights. Night. Uh, that also gets released through the week. You normally release it on uh, the following Tuesday, day, Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Wednesday. Cool. Cool. So check that out. And uh, you can go through our whole archive of shows either on the website, Let's Talk Network, or in our YouTube channel. Yeah. Cool. Thank you for watching. Cool. Go check it out.